Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. I was going to decide to do this, but I see a Overly Sarcastic Productions with Shadowversity in it. And I'm watching that first. This video is brought to you by NordVPN. More on that later. This makes Guys, make sure to use their uh, slash Overly Sarcastic. Original link to the video, top of the description. Please click that and use that link if you were convinced to get Nord through this uh, video. You know? Almost at two mil. How much? They need like 10,000 more. 0 0.01 of a million. Yeah. 10K more. Is my math right? Okay. Another Shadowversity with them in it. Hell yes. Okay, let's do it. My name's Connor. Hey. A massive thank you to my... Sound nuts. This video is brought to you by NordVPN. More on that later. This may sound nuts, but at one point, the Vikings directly and indirectly owned land in Russia, France, England, Italy, and the Levant, in addition to, you know, all of Scandinavia. Italy. See, when the Vikings started, they were all for raiding, pillaging, and telling Columbus to suck it because they got to America first. But after a couple centuries passed, they realized that trade networks were much more lucrative in the long term than rolling up to sack some random monastery. Can we agree that the the depictions of like what I think of a Viking, like a North, are just the most badass looking? Do they look exactly like this? Maybe, maybe not. But it just. It, in our psyche, like a Viking, still very much imprinted. Uh, let's go, I'm stalling. ...and telling Columbus to suck it because they got to America first. But after a couple centuries passed, they realized that trade networks were much more lucrative in the long term than rolling up to sack some random monastery once. Beyond that, they decided that the real power move wasn't wrecking stuff, but building stuff. Scandinavian colonization was a huge enterprise during the Viking Age, and their long ships, truly the S-tier of medieval seafaring, <laughs> if I do say so myself, carried them to the British Isles, the northern coast of of Europe, Iceland, Greenland, and beyond. But one Viking colony stands above the rest for being the coolest. Where is that? Where is this? Please tell me. And the most historically consequential, and it's the Normans. To find out just how these magnificent badasses left a massive mark on the northernmost and southernmost edges of Europe, let's do some history. The story of the Normans starts with the typical raiding. In France especially, the fragmented kingdom had Swiss cheese for defenses, so the usual- Listen, phones away, please pay attention. If you're not in the learning mood, then, then get out. The move was to politely ask- France especially, the fragmented kingdom had Swiss cheese for defenses, so the usual move was to politely ask the Vikings, hey, can we just bribe you guys to leave us alone? And the answer was often yes, but after the better part of a century and a couple excursions as far inland as Paris, King Charles finally said, hey, can we uh, bribe you and give you lands to finally leave us alone, please? And the Vikings were thrilled to accept. These Scandinavian raiders turned colonizers occupied a stretch of land along the English Channel, now known as Normandy because the Normans, aka That's so cool, and one of my favorite parts in learning about history always is th these moments that I have that I'm learning about. You know, I try to learn about English history a lot, and obviously the Normans are kind of Norman conquest, and it's at, it's connecting that to something else, and I, I'm just, I love that feeling. Occupied a stretch of land along the English Channel, now known as Normandy because the Normans, aka Northmen, lived there. Part of the deal was that these settlers would convert from their icky Norse paganism to Christianity, and as a more natural consequence, they started speaking French and assimilating into the local population. And it was good for both parties. Since the Normans had most of the swords, and therefore most of the bargaining power, they were able to get some serious autonomy from under the French crown. And the French got the heavy consequence of having a Viking buffer state, meaning no more raids for real this time. I'd go into more detail on why their military was so effective against an established kingdom like France, but medieval warfare isn't really my strong suit. But let's try this. <clears throat> Swords! Swords! Aha! Shad from the aptly named channel Shadowversity. Just who I was hoping for. Wow. I had no idea, though I probably should not be surprised, that my love for swords could carry me into the cartoon dimension. Your love for swords truly knows no bounds. Yeah, it is my special speed dial. That and knights, and, and castles, and dragons. So what did you call me for, mate?
The Normans, can you help me out? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure you'd do the same for me if I was in your position. Indeed. Should you by chance ever make a video about ancient Greek weapons and armor, I would gladly lend my services. Indeed. Indeed. I already got that set up. I'm with you. Anyway, the Norman army? Ah, uh, yes, the no <sighs> Back in three dimensions. The Normans. For the most part, the Norman army was actually not equipped too differently to the other armies that we see in medieval Europe during this time. So why swords? You see, when it comes to medieval weapon technology, when people see something that's working, they jump onto that and uh, they pick it up fairly quickly. For instance, one of- Guys, I know so sometimes my, like, it, it, you can't really hear me here. Like, I, my mic settings, I'm still fixing them. So if you can't hear me, half the stuff I say is nonsense anyway if you're new, so just don't worry about it. The advancement, they jump onto that and uh, they pick it up fairly quickly. For instance, one of the advancements that we see in this period was a shift away from the classic round style shield to a really cool shield, a shield I love. It's something, one that I feel is the best shield of all time. The, the kite drop. shield, okay? The kite shield offers more protection. It is almost as versatile. Wow. I call it the upside down teardrop, teardrop shield. Ah. Shield, okay. A kite shield offers more protection. It is almost as versatile and generally far better on cavalry because it offers overall more protection, but it also provides more ways in which to strap the shield onto your arm. And the strap configurations of the kite shield are by far for, far more numerous than many other types of shields. A big round shield can actually become fairly awkward when on horseback. Well, it isn't to mean that round shields were not used on horseback. They were, but they were generally smaller. And in regards to the kite shield, you will actually notice that it's thinner than your average round viking style shield and question 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 so i've got that shield instead of a kind of bulkier maybe a bit wider and more uniform shaped shield but when i have this shield i think i get what he means by i get why it would have a lot more strapping options because i would think almost like i would almost think to to put it like, like, like here, right? Like have it because I'm right-handed, so I'd want my sword in, in my or my spear in my right hand, and attach the shield to my left, and so like, a, 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 attach it like that, but have the pointy side of the shield be this side, and the more round spot be at, at my elbow. So that I, I feel like if you were to parry or block a a sword strike or something um, with the shorter side of the uh, shield, like that would be over your wrist, you'd be more more maneuverable and more easy to like counter strike. And with the bigger, more slightly wider, obviously wider part of the shield on 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 this side, so like teardrop tip over here and then and then a uh, bigger tip here for like if I'm trying to if I'm like trying to get more protection and maybe the fact that it's lighter but I hope somewhat heavy to use more with bashing so I just question and longer S speculation this again, making it okay like it looks like like this no yeah like it looks like this Oh shoot, I'm in the arrow thing. No, no arrow. Ah. That's a guy with like a sword. Like honestly, like I'm not much worse. I don't know why I drew a stick figure for the next guy. But then it's got like guys like this. Guys didn't think you'd be getting an art lesson today, did you? That's just... 
an example of the many surprises you you can expect over here at McJibbon. And it looks like they're, like, standing on them. You know? Like, hold on. You see? Like, uh, it's not the greatest drawing. It looks like the different levels. Like, the, it looks like these people are underground, and they're, like, standing on grass above it. Like, I'd rate that, like, a B-plus in third grade? Maybe fourth grade? And that's really one of the main distinctions. But looking at the weapons and armor, the English had kite shields, the Normans had kite shields. They were generally armored in the same way. We're looking at male hauberks generally coming down to the elbow. But we do see on the Bayer Tapestry certain soldiers, male. I thought a hauberk was a, a sort of a spear axe hybrid. Well, that actually covers the full arm and legs, so full extensive mail while it's still being developed as early as this period. Mail coifs, skull caps, nasal helmets, they were certainly being used. And as to the primary weapon that the infantry would be using, and indeed the cavalry as well, the spear. By far, the spear is the most prominent weapon by the Norman I arm. saw Shadowversity, I think it was Shadowversity's video, or was it Lindy Beach? Ooh, I think it was Lindy Beach. I haven't watched a Lindy Beach video in a while. I'll, I'll open it later. I'm gonna forget. Just let me... Lindy Beach, just so I don't forget. Oh my god, where was I? Here we go. And the English army, but also the only weapon. After the spear, we'll certainly see a lot of axes, and swords would be far less prominent. Because the spear is so superior to other weapons. Probably the least prominent weapon on that battlefield that you would easily all... identify as like, ha, it's iconic, it's a sword, you know what I mean. The distinctive thing about the Norman army was the cavalry and archers, but archers weren't too decisive. The big difference was the cavalry. Archers now that we have an army, decisive. let's... Decisive? What about... I'm thinking of the Hundred Years' War. What about Agincourt? Krejci, never mind. Take a look at... The decisive, the big difference was Sorry. the cavalry. Now that we have an army, let's take a look at their literal crowning achievement, the Norman Conquest. I'm skipping over some of the politics of it because the entire concept of hereditary monarchy is a gigantic farce, but basically, after the King of England died, there were three claimants to the throne. There was a farce. Conquest. Oh yeah, 1066. Even I know that, and I grew up in the US, and I still like, oh, 1066. And if you don't know what it is, it's just a familiar date. English King Harold Godwinson, the current Norwegian King Harold Hardrada, and finally Duke William of Normandy, clad in the plot armor of 10,000 protagonists. So in 1066, Godwinson takes the throne and the two other guys prepare an invasion. Now, while Hardrada and William were both Scandinavian in origin, the Normans were being rebellious teenagers and didn't care what their Scandinavian parents said about stealing entire kingdoms. But like all teenage kingdoms, the Normans procrastinated and the Norwegian Vikings made landfall in England first. And they got completely stomped to the Battle of Stamford Bridge, losing almost three quarters of their army. The bad news for Harold Godwinson was that he himself had lost around half his army in true Pyrrhic and or Marvel fashion. Take your pick. But the worst news came just three- I'm not a Marvel. I've never watched a Marvel, really. Days later, when, surprise, William of Normandy showed up in the south of England to take his turn at killing people for some shiny head gear. Adolf. So, Harold booked it down to Hastings with an exhausted and half-dead army. To see how it all unfolds, we now go live to field reporter Shad, who's broadcasting from the actual Battle of Hastings. No way. Uh, no, I'm not at the Battle of Hastings. Did you, um, did you? I got kind of excited there. I thought he'd be on, like, the actual field. Did you not get my time machine in the mail? Time machine? No. Yikes. That would have been so much better. It would have been funnier if they did, if he was like, and here's Shadowversity with uh, the cartoon representation of the Battle of Hastings. And Shadowversity would be like, I had no idea I had to make a presentation or anything. And him like, I sent you an email. You were supposed to do your own cartoon. Ah, or am I just... Screw you guys. Okay, I'm gonna call the post office to find out where that one went, but you, um, you talk about that battle thingy. Yeah. 
The first thing to mention about the Battle of Hastings is that it is a misconception to think that Harold came down to fight William directly after his fight with Hadrada. In actual fact, Harold was celebrating his victory when he found out about the Norman invasion and it took him a week to march down to England and then he spent Still. an additional week raising soldiers to face him. William and the Normans had actually hunkered down in Hastings. They would not be moving yeah, up. And if Harold... I, I, that actually is a big point because I thought, I always imagined like... The soldiers on the Godwinson side arriving at the Battle of, Hanks of Hastings like, uh, uh, we just pummeled the Vikings and now we're down here and we just made it for the battle. But they had a week to recover. In, uh, like it's, it's like having a Monday football game and then, a th and then you play again on Thursday, which sometimes happens. You guys are all Europeans. You're not going to get that NFL analogy wanted he could have spent more time raising more troops which would have been beneficial but he had just come off this big massive victory and so we think he might have been a bit too overconfident and he also wanted to come in and hit William while he was unprepared use the element of surprise and so he actually left when he had an army roughly about the same size as William and just marched down the problem is William found out about Harold's approach and then deployed his own troops ready to meet him Harold then found out about that and then picked a location on top of a hill to form a defensive line and this is the setting for the Battle of Hastings. The English army was comprised solely out of infantry, and in contrast to this, the Norman army was comprised out of archers, infantry, and cavalry in three separate groups based on the geographical location they came from. That being the Bretons, Normans, and Flemish. And yes, the Norman army was not solely comprised out of well, Normans. Question. Why didn't he just God? Why, um, he me being Godwinson. That's why I'm referring to as he. Why didn't he wait? to get word from like messengers of how William is doing. And then if he's not encroaching fast, guys, I get hindsight is 2020. It's easy for me to say, and it, he might not have, a, but it's just, did he think it doesn't seem like it was like, Oh, he's marching towards London, Londinium, where, whatever it's called. Uh, you need to go quick. It's like, why not just make sure you just defeated them that you have a very big force and then go. It seems a bit preemptive. Proactive. Cavalry was, of course, used before the medieval period, but it takes a lot of money to field cavalry. And so with the fall of Rome and the more decentralized system of governments that we see around this point in time, there is no state-fielded cavalry unit. But you can field cavalry on a smaller scale through individual lords, and this does seem to be what William did. There are huge advantages with cavalry, and the widespread adoption of cavalry in the medieval period after the Battle of Hastings seems to indicate that other people started to get the idea. But poor Harold didn't have this idea yet. Now, he didn't have archers either, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because with a big shield wall, you can defend yourself against archers, which is exactly what they did when William let loose those arrows. William sent in his infantry. Although in the end, Harold found the Norman archers to be his death. Is he the guy who got the arrow? Who's the guy who got the arrow? I reacted to a video about the uh, medical uh, surgeon procedure. For uh, an English king or someone got an arrow inside of their neck, head, I think, I think face, but it didn't like puncture anything super vital like the brain and he didn't die instantly. And they had to make a new tool to like go in and then clamp the arrowhead and then slowly pull it out. Who am I thinking of? is exactly what they did when William let loose those arrows. Hmm? William sent in his infantry, which had to attack uphill. They clashed with the English, and it was most... I don't, don't want to hear it. ...defend yourself against archers, which is exactly what they did. A bad thing, because with a big shield wall, you can defend yourself against archers, which is exactly what they did when William let loose those arrows. Brave William heart. sent in his infantry, which had to attack uphill. They clashed with the English, and it was mostly even. Harold had more infantry than William, but he didn't send them to engage the flanks of the Norman infantry perhaps because that would have made them vulnerable to William's archers. The cavalry then engages, and this is nowhere near as decisive as many people assume. They were not actually fully effective in this first engagement. They were not heavy cavalry with big lances. How would they be in danger of archers when they're engaging the enemy on the flanks? Because the archers would, would just as likely hit their own men with an arrow. 
fully armored that they could just rush in and try and trample a whole formation of men. Remember, these guys, they have big shields and spears, okay? So sending a cavalry charge in like that would be suicidal. Hit Instead, it's far more likely that the cavalry harassed the English by running up with higher elevation and launching spears over the line of shields of the English. Yet still, the English held. The true decisive moment in this battle was when the Normans started to lose, or we think they started to lose it. It could have been a planned retreat. We actually don't know, but this is really what determined the victor. The Normans' lines start to retreat, and those English engaging them pursued and broke formation. This wouldn't have been so bad in a usual battle, but the issue is the Normans have cavalry, and now you have a retreating line of Normans and English pursuing that are vulnerable on the sides. Their shields are not faced on the sides, and the cavalry that are already engaging the infantry staying on the hill, they look and they'll see open Englishmen charging against their own infantry. Vulnerable, open, ready to be destroyed, and that is exactly what happens. The cavalry charge in on the sides of these pursuing English infantry and just wipe them out. This unbalanced... Hold on. So, technically... So where is Godwinson from? Like, is he like the the grandson of a former Viking uh, conqueror who came to Britain, or is he a legitimate native Britain ruler? I think he's the former, right? So if he is an English ruler, Godwinson, like he's pure English, let me let me type in. I have to find out, actually. Let me... Let, let me uh. Uh, Harold Godwinson was the last crowned Anglo-Saxon English king. Where are his parents? Um, fast forward, guys, if you want to get back to the video, just click the right arrow button. You're dead to me, but you can get back to the video. Family background. Harold was the son of Godwin, a powerful Earl of Wethic, of Wethic, Wessex, and the and Gaitha Thorkel Stotir, who was brother of Ulf of Earl, married Savanta. Okay, so he seemed to be like a. Prior to the Normans invading, it seemed to be just sort of native English, Norwegian, Danish Vikings. What is Norwegian, Norway, and Dan and Denmark today, and maybe northern Belgium? Maybe not Belgium, uh, Netherlands, native or present-day Netherlands. But so, in a sense, doesn't that mean that the English were conquered in 1066, rather than like England being started? I'm gonna get a bunch of people yell at me, which I'm fine with. Whoa, excuse me. Jesus Christ. Oh no. Oh no. Phew. Balances the battlefield tremendously. The English are now outnumbered and the Normans push in and it's just a matter of time. Eventually the English leaders are killed off one by one and the entire army is routed and they retreat. So you could say the English lost because most of the troops were untrained and they broke formation when they shouldn't have been, which was actually contrary to Harold's order. And those men could have retreated perhaps because they also didn't understand the vulnerability they had moving forward like that to cavalry that are ready to just charge in and destroy them. So there we go. This is how the English were defeated in the Battle of Hastings and why the Normans won. So back to you, Blue, and uh, have you had any luck finding that Thanks, package? Chad. Yeah, so apparently I needed to write more than just Australia on the package. Go figure. I so like red better, Blue. Get out of here. No, he's awesome too. But I do like red better. Red's voice is just so soothing to me. I don't know why. Okay. Somebody's gonna have Creepy. an interesting weekend. Anyway, after earning his epithet the Conqueror, William turned around and got started governing his new kingdom. He first kicked out the disjointed feudal aristocracy and replaced it with a more bureaucratic assortment of mostly Normans, which helped centralize the English state. And this was par for the course for William, since he did much the same thing in his earlier years as a Norman duke. It worked for the Persians. This is doubly infuriating to me because it's a history joke. I hate it when I don't understand a joke, period. That's a history joke that I don't understand. And I feel like less of a man.
English state. And this was par for the course for William, since he did much the same thing in his Someone early- Someone explain to me that analogy. What is the Persians, what's years the Persian example? as a Norman duke. While the commoners still spoke their old Anglo-Saxon sounding language, the Norman aristocracy all oui, spoke oui, French, baguette. and in time yeah, the two merged Jacques. to create what we understand to be English. And that's why our language is full of ro- in time the two merged to create what we understand to be English. And that's why our language is full of romance vocabulary, such as language, romance, and vocabulary. The Norman huh. influence also- I heard that chamber and room are the exact same thing, but chamber is the French word, and room is the Germanic word. And so like when, when it's a more fancy room, it's called a chamber. Let me know if I'm wrong there. I don't think I am. Explains why that transition is so fast compared to what came after. We started with Beowulf's practically illegible Old English in 1000 and got to Chaucer's weird but sensible Middle English 400 years and coincidentally one metric the Normans later. But out of my scattering and funfair of Vernon's, if we're not for your quiet, nor your good, nor your manhood, honestly, of wife them. English hasn't really changed all that much since. On the British side of Europe, the Normans reached out to dabble with Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. But let's keep things on topic and talk about the other Norman conquest, that of Southern Italy. In the centuries after Rome kicked the bucket and the bucket kicked back, southern Italy became the pinata of the Mediterranean. Everyone took a swing at it, hoping to crack it open and get the metaphorical imperial candy that lay within, but no one could make a unified state, so instead it was just kind of beat wow, up. Wow, Sicily is, was Muslim during this time? Imperial candy that lay within, but no one could make a unified state, so instead it was just kind of beat up. Like this awful pinata metaphor I'm starting to regret, but the point is the whole sea was fractured, and southern Italy was a microcosm of that splintering between Catholic, Byzantine, and Muslim powers. That all changed when the Normans walked into the peninsula like, what up, I got a big cavalry, and conquer the fragmented south from the Muslims, Byzantines, and Catholics. Is the Byzantine Empire have anything to do with the start of Protestantism? and Martin Luther, or is that completely unconnected? At one point, they defeated the Pope's army and then profusely apologized after. They may be conquerors, but they always remembered their manners. The trickiest ah, part of the good. campaign was the push into Muslim Sicily in 1064, two years before Hastings. But they called off the entire campaign because their camp was full of spiders, which is enough to make anyone ah. either leave or napalm the entire island. Six years later, they tried again and won, and another six years later, the southern half of Italy was firmly Norman. But here's the kicker. In the process of building up this newly unified kingdom of Sicily, the Normans created an open and tolerant society where Catholics, Greek Orthodox Christians, and Muslims all lived and worked together. It's the same trick the Normans pulled in France, in England, and now in Italy. It's almost like assimilating cultures makes you better off or something. Who knew? In addition to their military and their innovation in governments and scholarship, the more tangible remnants of this Norman legacy lie in the architecture of castles and churches. Now, Shad, I understand you have a passing interest in castle design, so why don't you take this I've one? I've seen one of his videos. <laughs> it will be my pleasure. Now, to begin, there's actually a lot of complexity to the employment and use of castles. Why they were built, why they are so good at what they do. So I'm going to have to try and summarize and keep it brief, which is really difficult for me if you know anything about me. Fundamentally, castles enable a small force to be able to repel a very large force. But in this instance, it also enables a small force to retain control over a very large area. Indeed, over an area of people who might not be too happy with the new rulers. Now, remember, the local population far outnumbers any force that William has, so he needs a way to multiply his offensive ability to control this unruly, newly conquered land. Sports, sports, so this sports. is how castles can be used offensively. They're not just a defensive structure, they can be used offensively, and this is exactly how, by placing one... Well, they can be used offensively through their defense. Right? And plonk right in the middle of an area you want to control. You have a small force, but they, they can't be taken out because they are so well protected. And then they can strike out in force at the times they determine to collect taxes or quell uprisings and things like that. And then if the unruly populace wants to try and attack back, all they have to deal with is castle. And that's a problem because it takes a very large that's number. so smart, just waiting there until you observe the social or political environment around you that's rife for easy pickings and then retreat when it's not ripe until it is. 
It's not to say it didn't happen. There were times in which the English actually rose up and rebelled and did overrun some of these early castles. But those uprisings were costly because they had to deal with a castle and were quickly squashed. The most classic type of castle in this period is known as the Mott and Bailey. The Mott being a large earthwork with a defensive tower atop of it, and a bailey is an enclosed kind of secured section separate to it, which were made out of wood by the way, but William himself did actually start to build some stone square keeps. So stone castles, at least in part, did exist even as early as after the Battle of Hastings. I've made a whole video it's on- It's like such a perfect, just a classic castle. Like if, if castle were in the dictionary and needed to be accompanied by a photo, this would be it in part did exist even as early as after the Battle of Hastings. I've made a whole video on the weaknesses and problems of Mott and Bailey castles and why they evolved to be something different, but why were they specifically made this way, this way to begin with? And I actually believe it's because of the Norman Conquest that actually happened quite recently. They needed a defensive thing built up quickly, and so the Mott needed to be built first and foremost. This so is who a created the idea that like moats were always filled? If you grew up in the, it's, it's like moats and alligators, like there were crocodiles and alligators in the moats, but that was just a Hollywood thing. The most offensive and defensive part of this castle, especially if the populace are going to catch wind of this and want to stop them doing it, they need to build this thing quickly. So the mot was done first because if they wanted to build the whole thing, the bailey, with at the same time, it would take longer. But once you have the mot, you're well defended, you're ready to go, and then you can take a bit more time to secure any other buildings that you want to add or attach close to this mot. There are examples where a castle was just a mot and tower by itself. <laughs> and ones that actually had more just a bailey kind of enclosure with some type of tower but eventually the Motten bailey design did go out of favor and evolved to be far more the star fortress effective in the more traditional castle layout and design oh. yet still we can credit the normans for kicking off castle construction majorly that set up the foundation for castles throughout the whole medieval period and on the other side of that was more spiritual construction, Jesus. where the Normans were also prolific. In particular, the Capella Palatina in Palermo is a masterpiece of design, combining styles from all over the Mediterranean. Inscriptions appear in Arabic, Greek, and Latin, Byzantine mosaics mixed with arabesque geometry. Where's Palermo? Oh, Sicily. Okay. It's truly gorgeous, and there are loads of other places in Norman Italy where you can still see how dedicated they were to building a morally and socially strong society beyond just a militarily strong one. The Normans also built the cathedrals of Monreale and Palermo, which, at the risk of gushing about it for another 15 minutes, I'll just show you these pictures and move on. Norman Sicily was also a capital of Mediterranean scholarship, as their good friends the Byzantines and the Muslims were both going through golden ages. One achievement that I'm quite fond of is the Tabula Rogeriana, a map created by a Muslim scholar based on the accounts of Norman trade. It's a Damn, that's impressive. Triumph of cartography and cultural anthropology. That is insanely impressive. And independent of the Normans, whether it's scholarship or art or what have you, my favorite settings in history will always be the ones where cultures converge. I'm almost upset that there's no more places to be mapped out because I think that would be really fun. Like, I don't know what this area actually looks like. Let's walk around and use weird measurements and try and, like, put it on a map. There's nothing more satisfying than seeing multiple civilizations bring their A-game. It's unique, and it's fun, and, and it's fight? difficult sometimes, but it is worth it, damn it. So insane as it may sound, the Normans went even further afield than Italy, as they conquered Antioch during the First Crusade. But I'm stretching myself a little bit thin here, so let's return to where this all started. A century after William's conquest, England under the House of Anjou had doubled back to swipe up half of France, and in 1202, France set out to make France France Accuracy. again, so they reconquered Normandy from England, which kicked off about 600 years of the two powers absolutely you're a right no bend you know that or nobbend bullocks absolutely hating each other the politics are actually way more complicated than that but now i'm just stretching myself thin here by talking about english and french history and i can be here all day so i think the takeaway here is that the norman Go legacy is way bigger than any one nation and their success lies in how far they spread how thoroughly they laid their foundations and how gradually they faded into the background even when normandy england and southern italy stopped being ruled explicitly by the normans the effects of that history remained firmly rooted in place for centuries the normans were fighters yes i mean these are the descendants of vikings we're talking about here, but through exploration, trade, state building, 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 and a drive to assimilate, they became so much more. I mean, the Normans conquered the area that developed into the most wide-ranging empire in the world that 
formed that had many colonies that turn into very productive nations that are around right now, America included. And so you, you, you cannot, I think it is impossible to overstate um, the kind of butterfly effect, uh, something like stopping the invasion of Norman, uh, the Norman invasion of England, you know? Than just that. So, I mean, yeah, conquering huge swaths of land is cool, but have you ever established a network of interconnected kingdoms that bring out the best of local cultures and lay firm groundwork for centuries of continuous governance that would subtly but powerfully drive the course of European history? Because if not, you're really missing out. So, I prefer Shad, my own. What do you think about all okay. this? Well, I think it is profoundly interesting. I mean, who would have thought descendants of Vikings would have built kingdoms ranging as far as England and Italy? It's amazing. It's like if Venice was actually good at colonization. Or the Romans, if they had any restraint. Oof, truth hurts. Regardless, always a pleasure to have you on the channel. Thanks for stopping by and helping me out with all this medieval stuff. Th thanks, thanks for having Chad. me, Blue. And you know, you should spend more time looking at the medieval period, because you know what you'll find? Swords. We have so many swords. It's unbelievable. This guy gets very excited over swords. You get a sword, I get a sword. Everyone gets a sword. <laughs> I want a sword. Anyway, I hope to see you there. And until then, For farewell. decorative purposes. The Norman sure got around back in the day, but if you want to make like a Viking and travel the world through the magic of the interwebs, look no further than today's topical sponsor, Sponsor, Nordic. use their link, uh, slash overly sarcastic, please. PN. As we engage more and more with the online world, and as cyber sleuths get better and better at stealing my goddamn credit card information last month, <sighs> It's only getting more important to protect your data, and a secure virtual private network is a great way to do that. As I write these words, I'm in a cafe on public Wi-Fi, which can normally be pretty risky, but as far as my d I write these words, I'm in a cafe on public Wi-Fi. People actually like to go to the cafe to... to which can normally be pretty risky, but as far as my digital self is concerned, I'm safe and secure. Not with everyone's as lazy as I am, so I shouldn't be surprised. Over in Denmark with just a couple easy clicks. NordVPN is offering you 75% off a three-year plan and a free bonus month if you go to nordvpn.com slash overly sarcastic. Free VPN sounds nice, but in reality can be extremely shady, so trust your information to the military-grade encryption of Nord servers. It also comes with an ad blocker, which is just a cool bonus. But it's not only a matter of security. With Nord, you can access content from around the world with a click. Discovering ad blocker was one of the most life-changing things. I love, I've watched many YouTube videos, obviously. So when you go to Greece for the summer, you can watch American Netflix after you realize that the Greek Netflix doesn't have the Medici show that I was in the middle of watching before I was so rudely interrupted by the confines of world geography. So anyway, whether you're on a laptop or your phone, your data is worth protecting. I don't so have the attention to span to watch like long series. I'm pathetic. Like even Breaking Bad and Dexter, I, I only watched them like many, many years after like the finales had already ended, you know? NordVPN.com slash overly sarcastic and use the code overly sarcastic to get 75% off use three it, years of secure data. Done. Thanks again to NordVPN and for more globetrotting goodness, hop over to Australia to check out my appearance in Shadiversity's video on ancient Greek weapons and armor. Already got it ready. One step ahead. My patrons. I'm not doing it now, obviously. All right, awesome video, guys, from uh, Overly Sarcastic Productions. Phenomenal. I like red better, but blue, you're awesome too. He's uh, he's great. They're both great. Okay, guys, see you next time. Bye. If you are not doing well, listen to me right now. Stop. Stop it. Listen to me. You'll be good soon. Trust me. Okay. Emotions are fickle, my friend. Bye, guys. No, not. Bye, guys. Finally.